another lesson that I did at camp last week about God's peace and rest. Um, and I don't feel bad about it. A little bit, but... Um, you know, one of the things that I said when I was talking about some of this to people about, oh man, you know, I just, you do the whole week of camp and um, I'm going to redo some of the stuff that, that I did and I get, I get this input a lot. Good, everybody needs to hear it. And you all have heard some of this stuff before, a lot of this stuff, most of it before. Um, but um, there are some good lessons and whenever I talk about when I go through the lesson, things get clearer to me and I think of things as I say it that I didn't think whenever I was writing. And so I would like to think that you get the best version or a, a better version, um, at least of where I am in my understanding of things. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. There are two things from this lesson that uh, really sets up some of the new stuff uh, with Jesus with us as a church and what our hope of heaven ultimately is. In the Old Testament version, though, there are two things. Uh, if we're going to talk about God's peace and God's rest, there's only one place to find it, and that is in God's presence. That's, that's it. There, there is no peace and rest away from the presence of God. It is being in the presence of God that is the peace and the rest that we're looking for. And when I say rest, I'm not just talking about laying down and taking a nap like I did this afternoon. I'm talking about the rest, the rest in your soul that the entire world is looking for and craving right now. The peace in your heart. It is only found in the presence of God. So that's number one. I want to show you that. And this is your part and it wasn't until I actually did this lesson and listened to myself that I figured I didn't really quite hammer the right point at camp thinking through some of this and so I'll try to be better with that with you all tonight. The first point is the peace and the rest that we're looking for are only found in the presence of God. The second thing is there is no presence of God in the presence of sin. Sin is the enemy. Sin is the thing that says you can no longer be in the presence of God. And so we'll see the example in the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle and the temple. We'll look at those three examples um, tonight. But I'll just go ahead and tell you right now what I'm ultimately leading to in all of this. We want to be in the presence of God and sin is, is the enemy of that. And so for us, our takeaway from this lesson is that we've got to clean our lives out. Um, now, there's, there's a right way to say that and a wrong way to say that. I can't fix my sin. Jesus can fix my sin. Um, and he can forgive me, and there's nothing I can do about my sin and the mistakes that I make. But i got to stop. We've got to stop the sin. Whatever the sin in our life is, that is the ongoing continual problem... That is the thing that keeps us from the presence of God. And that's got to get cut out. We've got to get serious about saying, if we're really after this peace and rest, and we're really after the presence of God and being in the presence of God, we've got to get serious about getting that sin out of here. However we do it and whatever we have to do. I think you talk about the serious level of this. This is what Jesus was saying. If you've got to poke your eye out, so be it. You've got to cut your hand off. He, the, the, uh, the message is, this is a serious conversation and we got to get serious about it. So let me show you uh, what I'm talking about. I know that, that you all have heard this a lot. It's a, it's a major theme through the Bible. Um, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, here is the presence of God. Adam and Eve in the garden. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Um, so that idea of God... Walking in the garden, walking in the presence of man. Um, that is what makes the Garden of Eden the Garden of Eden. It's not the trees and the fruit and the river. It is the fact that this is where God is. This is the place where God walks among man. And so you've got the presence of God in the garden. We looked at this earlier this morning in Genesis chapter 5. Um, 
the idea of being and living and walking in the presence of God is the thing that we're after. So we talked about Enoch in verses five, chapter 5, verse 22, and also verse 24. Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So he's not living like everybody else lives. He's walking with God. He lives in the presence of God. He lives with the presence of God. And because of that, he doesn't die like everybody else dies. Turn over to Leviticus 26. You can see, I think, a, a really good example of this. In Leviticus 26, this is the blessings and the curses. So it starts in verse 3. If you will do the things that I told you to do, uh, then you'll be blessed. But listen to the way that God says it. Verse 3. If you walk in my statutes, if you it, it's, it's live your life, it's walk with me. If you walk with me in your life, then you're going to be blessed. Verse 14, but if you will not, then uh, here are all the curses that are going to come upon you. Look down at verses uh, 11 and 12. This is the, if you walk with me, this is the end of it. I will make my dwelling among you. It's the presence of God. If you walk with me, we can be together. Um. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you will be my people. Um, so there's the presence of God, and the presence of God is just intimately connected to, if you're going to walk with me, you have to walk in my ways. You can't walk with me and be in my presence and do all of that stuff out there. Uh, if you're going to do all that stuff out there, then you got to go out there. There's a funny thing. Um, look in your Bibles. I guess we won't look at this one yet. Sorry, I, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Genesis chapter 3 talks about um, Adam and Eve who were with God in the Garden of Eden, but sin came to creation. Um, Verse 23, this is the last part of the story. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and he, at the east of the garden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, example number one. What a great blessing to live in the presence of God and to live in the rest and the peace that God intended from the start. But sin came into the world and sin was the thing that said, no, you can't do this anymore. You got to go out into the cursed world now. You can't live with God, the presence of God in the presence of sin. So there you go. Example number one. We'll do the same thing two more times. Turn over to Exodus 25. This is the story of the tabernacle. And with the tabernacle, you see uh, the idea of God saying to Israel, hey, been a long time since the Garden of Eden, but I want to come back to live with you, to be in your presence. And so God gives Israel the Ten Commandments, the law in Exodus 20. And then in 21, 22, and 23, he says, these are the laws that you, that you as Israel, that you live according to my word. Here are the laws. He gives it to them. And then you come to chapter 25. And the whole rest of Exodus, well, except for the golden calf incident, which kind of falls in the middle. But the whole rest of Exodus is, now God has said, come out of slavery. Now you're people. You're my people. I'm your God. You're my people. Um, we're going to be together. Here are my laws. Live according to my ways. Walk in my ways. And then in 25, he starts this, and I want you to build a house for me. The tabernacle, a tent. And the idea here is, you're going to be my people. You're going to walk in my ways. So I'm going to live in your presence. I'm going to be with you. 25 and verse 8. Let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Jump to the very last verse of the book of Exodus. Not quite the last verse. Chapter 40, verse 34. They build the tabernacle. They do everything that God told them to do. As you're reading through this last section, it's really hard to miss 
uh, and they did all that the Lord commanded. They did everything that God said exactly like God said to do it. And here is the, the end result of him coming. Then verse 34, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I'm going to ask that you, that's worth highlighting in your Bible, by the way, but I'm going to ask that you will remember that here the people and God's glory, his presence has moved into that house. Now he's there. He's present among the people. You're going to see that again in the temple, but you're going to see it in the New Testament. And I think that I'm going to do that lesson. I'm going to combine three more lessons for next Sunday morning. I think that's what I'm going to do. You'll see in in the New Testament where the presence of the Lord comes. But you got to remember this. God says, do my stuff, be my people, and I will come and, and fill the house up. I will be present among you. Here's the presence of God. Okay, the funny thing. Turn to Deuteronomy 23. Uh, as we're going through Deuteronomy 23, we're going to start reading in verse 12. And I want you to imagine... What these verses are like, reading them out to 200 kids. Super good time. Um, I'll tell you, it, this falls into my great passion and love for potty humor that Becky just loves about me so much. Especially when I share that with the, the children. She just really enjoys that whole thing. Um, and, and there is some of that here. But before we read it, I want to, to tell you something. It's funny. I... Treat it a little bit like potty humor, like you could laugh about some of these things. But there is a real lesson here. There really is. There is a real lesson that's very practical and very real worth paying attention to as you read through this. So God lives in the presence of Israel. Here is the camp of Israel. And here's the tent where God lives. And so with that in mind, start Deuteronomy 23 and verse 12. It says... You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall go out to it, and you shall have a trowel, that's just a shovel, a little trouble with your tools, and when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up your excrement. So um, go outside the camp to go to the bathroom. It seems like just good, decent society rules, like we don't have bathrooms set up, you know. Um, like a state park, here's a bathroom set up. Um, this is the camp where everybody lives. Go outside the camp. Dig a hole and cover it up. But listen, this is the part about this that I'm really interested in this because God says the why here in verse 14. Why do this? Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. To deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. And so this is the, this is the potty humor part of this. that I say it, and it's, I say it a little bit funny, but I mean, it's right from the Bible. It's real. God says, take your poop out there um, because I'm walking around you in here. But, you know, apply... Apply the concept and apply the picture to our lives and to what it means to be holy and what it means to be God's people. And here is God living in our midst and this is what it means to live in the presence of God. You can't have foul stuff sitting around your life that God's going to step in. You take the foul stuff and you drop it out there. And you leave it out there because it doesn't belong in the presence of God. If God is present among us, then the unclean things in our lives can't be present among God either. That's the point. That's what, that's what the picture is going to. And it's a, it's a physical picture of going to the bathroom. But it's, it's, it's figurative for what we should be thinking about sin in our lives. If God is going to be present among us, we got to get that stuff out. 
It cannot be present in our lives in the place where God is. 1 Samuel chapter 4. We'll go over and read some there. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, in verse 12, Israel did not do what God told them to do. He was patient and he hung with them for a little while, but they didn't. In verse 12, um, Israel is out fighting against the Philistines. And they've just lost the battle. So here comes a runner to tell Eli, the priest, that Israel has just lost the battle. And worse news even than that. Verse 12. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh. That's the part I want you to remember. Um, and I'll say this. Just about this real quick. I don't know about you. And when you read the Bible, what you think of and what things. You know, there are some things. The Garden of Eden. That's a major part of, of what I think about the Bible and words that I know and things like the tabernacle, the temple, the church. Um, there are some things that we're just really, really familiar with and that we know. And the more I read through the Bible, the more I think Shiloh should be one of those things. Shiloh is the place where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, lived, and it's the place that we're reading about right now. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt in his head. And he arrives and he talks to Eli. Um, let's see, verse 17. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to read the whole story. Verse 17. He who brought the news answered and said, this is what has happened. Israel has fled before the Philistines. There's been a great defeat among the people. So, um, piece of news number one. We lost the war. We got destroyed by the enemy. Piece of bad news number two. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they're dead. Your kids are dead. They lost too. Bad news, piece of, uh, piece of bad news number three at the end of this. And the ark of God has been captured. And as soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died for the man was old and heavy. Um, that one, the presence of God, God said, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to be in your midst and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And Eli knew exactly what was going on here. God's gone. We sinned and God left is the point. Jump down at the end of this section of verse 22. This is, um, I guess we could start in verse 21. Um, one of the priest's wife has a kid. She named the kid Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. That's the kid's name. The kid's name is the glory of God has departed. Ichabod, because the ark of God had been captured because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Turn over to Psalm 78. As you're turning over to Psalm 78, just make the point. And this, this is, I think, where I messed up a little the first time or I didn't quite put the emphasis in the right place. Don't think for one second that you can continue in sin and that God's just going to overlook it and his presence is just going to continue to dwell among you or among his people. There is no presence of God in the presence of sin. And so this story is telling us the story of Israel would not walk in God's ways. And so God left. He left the people to be on their own. In Psalm 78 verses 56 through 61. That's what this is about. Israel tested and rebelled against the most high God. And did not keep his testimonies. But turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow. I was thinking about that with the Olympics things. I've only seen a couple. I've only seen a couple um, Olympics things. We were gone last week you know. And so. Um, Here's a bow, and you see him aiming, and just goes straight. Imagine that you have a twisted bow, and you pull it, and you shoot, and the bow goes, kind of like a firework. The bow just, the, the arrow just goes wild. 
whenever you shoot it. That's the picture that we're talking about here. They twisted. Israel. Israel twisted like a deceitful bow and you don't the things that are supposed to go straight don't go straight anymore with them in verse 58 they provoked God to anger in their high places they moved him to jealousy with their idols and when God heard he was full of wrath and he utterly rejected Israel he forsook his dwelling at Shiloh the tent where he dwelt among mankind and delivered his power to captivity his glory to the hand of the foe God says, if you're going to continue to walk in sin, I'm out of here. I'm not going to live in the presence of sin. Example number three, 1 Kings chapter 8. We'll just read a few more passages. In 1 Kings chapter 8, this is the story of Solomon's temple. And Solomon has built it by this part. And chapter 8 is when everything's done, they take the Ark of the Covenant, they move it into the temple. And some of this language ought to sound really familiar to you because it's, it's almost exactly like what happened with the tabernacle. Verse 10, when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand and minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So here's a really good message. I'm not, I'm not hammering this message as much as the other one. But one really good message is that God doesn't say in the Garden of Eden, well, you blew it and you never get another chance. The, the story of the Bible is chance after chance after chance after chance. And God says, okay, well, let's try this again. And Israel does not walk with the Lord and they sin and God leaves. But then God says, let's try it again. And so here he is with the temple. It's, it's his mercy and it's his grace and it's his patience and long suffering. All of these things. Turn over to Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah says something about this. In Jeremiah chapter 7, the prophet is talking to Israel about how they are not walking in God's ways. And he's saying to them, guys, God has done this before and he's going to do it again unless we get our stuff figured out. You can't just continue to live in sin. In Jeremiah 7 and verse 12, go now to my place that was in Shiloh. Remember that? Go to that place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen, and when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place I gave to you and to your fathers as I did to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight as I cast out all of your kinsmen, all of the offspring of Ephraim. God refuses to live in the presence of sin. So God's peace and God's rest, that thing, that thing that you're after. This is the way that I defined it to the kids. You know the opposite of peace and rest? It's this. I don't know any other way to describe it with words. That's the thing that you feel in your soul when you don't have it. And the opposite of that is the peace and the rest and the sense of contentment um, that only comes in the presence of God. But here's the thing. There is no presence of God in the presence of sin. And the practical message for us is we better get serious about taking care of sin. It can't be in our lives. And it can't be in our congregation. It's out there. And there's nothing we can do about it. Except teach those people about forgiveness through Jesus and hopefully bring them in. But it can't be in here. This is at least what we're shooting for. Look at Haggai chapter 1. I read this a little bit ago when I did Haggai, and I, I told you I really, really enjoyed my study of Haggai. Haggai 1, I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. God left the temple. You can read about that if you want, if you're taking notes and you want to have... If you want to have notes to follow along with this theme, it's Ezekiel chapter 10 and 11. 
God, there's a picture. Ezekiel has a, a vision in Ezekiel 10 and 11 of God getting into his chariot and he drives out of the temple and he leaves away from Jerusalem. Um, and so Israel sent into captivity and God gives them another shot and they come back and we've been talking about that with the restoration with Ezra and Nehemiah and all these things. Haggai chapter 1 and verses 4 through 6. Here's what Israel did. They did not get busy building God's house to live in God's presence. And so in verse 4, is it a time for you to dwell is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Um, we're all focusing on our own stuff and trying to build up our own lives and trying to fill those lives with things that are going to give us a sense of peace and rest and contentment and happiness while the presence of God and the place where he lives just goes completely neglected. Verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. So here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to fill up my life with all of my own effort and I got a bag and I'm going out and I'm working and I'm surrounding myself with people that I think are going to fill the God shaped hole in my heart. And I'm going through all of these efforts and I got even the meditation app on my watch to have some rest and some peace in my life. And it's like collecting money and I'm putting all of this money into my bag, but the bag has holes and it all just keeps draining out and going away and it never fills up. And the idea is that we're never going to fill the God-shaped hole in our soul except with God. The peace and the rest that we're looking for only comes with the presence of God. And the enemy of the presence of God is our sin. So the sin has got to be taken care of. Without God, the world and our lives are just going to continue to spiral more and more out of control. And there is no stopping it ever. It's a hopeless adventure. Everybody's going to try to fill the emptiness with something. But there are no substitutes. So there you go. Take this lesson and um, think about Think about what you want in your life and what you want in your kids' lives and the, the rest and the peace that you want your kids to have. And remember that this is the only way they're ever going to have it. Truly, tr truly, this is the only way they're truly, really ever going to have it is the presence of God. Which means that we as individuals and we as a church family have got to take care of the sin. We've got to get serious about that. I don't have any one specific thing in mind. Don't don't come up after the lesson and be like, Ooh, like you really think. I'm not, I'm not targeting any one sin. I'm just saying sin is the thing that ruins everything. And we got to get serious about cleaning it up and getting it out. So if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, this is your opportunity. I think next Sunday morning we're going to talk about Jesus coming as the presence of God and what that means for your life. Um, but I don't want to make you wait until next Sunday to think about that or do something about it. If you know about Jesus and how he offers forgiveness and fixes the problem of sin that we have and that Jesus makes it so that we can actually continue to live in the presence of God and you're ready to do something about that now tonight, we would love to help you with that. Come forward, make your needs known as together we stand and sing the invitation song. I know.